Awesome. Thanks so much for being here. Especially thank you because it's the last session on the last day and everyone's exhausted. So give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> um, I really just wanted to go through, I really just wanted to go through, I speak to a lot of early career devs and a lot of questions come up. So this is really kind of 101 overview of music licensing and typical kind of questions. You know, how do you talk to a composer? A lot of people want to hire a composer for, you know, create bespoke music for their game, but they have no idea how to go about that conversation. So that's what my talk is about. So I get a lot of questions. Um, you know, what sort of things should I be discussing in the conversation I have with a composer? A lot of developers don't feel confident. You know, how, how do I even facilitate that conversation? What sort of things should I be asking them? So that's what I want to cover. Um, I also have a lot of developers sort of say, well, I just really want to focus on building my game now and I'll worry about all that sort of stuff later. So let's not worry about a contract now. Let's, um, let's talk about that later. Um, and what I really want to express is why it's really important to have these conversations now so that people know, um, so that as a developer you know exactly who can do what with the music, what, what you can do with it, who owns what um, and how you can use it in your game. And also a lot of people say, well, when I hire an artist, I own that IP and it's only used for my game, so isn't that the same with the music? Why is it that um, you're saying you can use that music elsewhere? You know, why isn't it the same as an artist? And ultimately the reason is because music has value. There are a lot of avenues that you can earn money with music, um, and I suppose that's ultimately why it's different with an artist. I don't think there are as many opportunities to put your, your art up on, you know, Unity Store or whatever it is, um, but music, Depending on the license, you know, you could put it into TV and film and games and corporate um, and YouTube and podcasts and there's just so many avenues to, to earn money from music. So ultimately, it's music has value and it's about, well, how much value is this worth? And so that's why maybe you look at licensing it rather than buying it. Um, and we're going to go through its different licensing options and why that's probably a better option for people with lower budgets. So these are the types of questions I do want you to be thinking about. Um, I mean, what kind of agreement do you make with a composer? Like, how do you hire a composer? Do you, do you, do you hire someone part-time, full-time? Or do you just do you create a contract? How much does game music actually cost? A lot of people, when I speak to them, you send them their music and they say, oh, I think you're appropriate. Well, what do you charge? And it's like, well, it's not as simple as that. that. I need to understand your game more, so we'll talk about that more. Who gets the money from the OST sales? So there's money there. If, um, you know, a, a gamers love music um, and they love buying the music for games. So there's money there. Might only be a couple of thousand dollars, but it's still money. So who gets the money from that? If you haven't discussed that, uh, you know, there can be problems. Who can upload the music to Spotify, Bandcamp and YouTube? So you want to help promote the game through music. Who can do that? Whose profile can you put it on? That's based on the license that you have. A lot of people say, well, I don't have a lot of money, but I need, need music uh, composed for my game. You know, what can I do? What are my options? And there are different options. There are different types of licenses. There are different things, points of negotiation that you can offer a composer rather than just an upfront fee. And a lot of composers will offer to compose your game for free. Should you say yes? And what things should you think about? They're just some questions to think about. So I just want to get a really quick brief overview of what audio in games is because another question that comes up is, well, I need an audio designer, so doesn't that mean they design all the audio in games? So that means the, you know, the music and film, uh, uh, music in the, the music composition and the sound effects, what does that actually mean? So the main points, the main parts of audio in games are music composition, the sound effects, implementation, which a lot of people forget about, so the implementation side is the technical aspect. So once you've got your WAV files, so you've got the music and the sound effect files, how do you get that into the game? And that's the technical part, and you need someone to do that. So it might be a technical implementer, and that's someone that you have to hire to do that, or someone on your team might do that. But you need to think about how you're going to get the music in the game. And then voiceover, and I'm not talking about voice talent, I'm talking about the files. If you're getting dialogue for your game, who's managing that? Who's recording it? Who's cleaning up the audio and cutting it all up 
and naming it so it's all ready to go to get into the game, and there's work around that. So there's no answer in terms of who does this. Um, a, a person may do all. Someone might say that they're a, a composer and they do sound effects implementation and everything. Um, typically, sound, sound designers will do the implementation, but they may not. And the best thing for you to do is have a chat with someone and ask them what they do and what their services are. But there are the different parts and you need to think about them. You may need one or many audio people on your team for that. So different hiring arrangements. It's the most common is having a contractor. You usually contract the work out to someone. Um, another question is, well, how long do I need to hire someone? If you've got someone on contract, often you're talking about the contract will state what the deliverables are, deadlines, and they're there to help meet your milestones in your game, um, rather than a sort of a, a time-based thing. So as long as your game takes to develop is how long a, a composer will work for you. Um, but a good thing to have in your con contract, you know, you, generally you specify deliverables, um, deadlines and payments, so you might split the payment up. You might, you know, have a, an upfront payment to, for the composer to get started, and then you might have payments based on milestones that they reach, and that's a really good thing to do. Um, also, the contract kind of needs to state that the composer is, is an independent contractor, which helps understand that they own the IP and they're licensing it out to you, um, and you're not paying them a salary. The contract also um, states the developer's usage of rights of the music, so it really gets down to how you can use the music, where you can use the music, in the game, in the promotion of the game, in trailers, etc. You know, a good question is, um, can the music be used in the sequel? This comes up a lot. What other parts can the music be used? Can it be used in the DLC? content, and that's something that needs to be specified in the contract. Usually, it's not, you know, if a composer has composed for your game, it's not that you can't use that music in the sequel. You need to then gain another licence for that, but that needs to be specified in the contract. But it might be, you know, maybe you can use it in the DLC content, but it needs to be in the contract. And then it also, the contract also specifies what the composer can do with game footage, because they need permission to be able to promote the game. Um, they want to be able to promote the game on their reels and their website. Um, and maybe for the sale of the OST, the album art, they need permission for that. So that's specified in the contract. Termination clause. Unfortunately, a lot of games get cancelled. <laughs> what happens to the music? What, what's the rights around the music? Maybe you've said, oh, well, I'll have an exclusive licence for, for, the, for the music. And the game's cancelled. What happens to it? Does it revert back to the composer? Do you keep the rights? That needs to be specified in the contract. And warranties and indemnities. Unfortunately, composers do steal music. And it does happen. Um, what happens if the composer has stolen music from someone else? And you release the game and someone comes after you and wants to sue you. What happens then if, you've, if it's in a contract often you'll have a, a statement about warranties and indemnities. And the composer is saying, I create the music, it's original work, I haven't stolen it, and I take on that responsibility. Something else to, to understand about um, rights um, and copyright with music is that once the, 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 defi the, the understanding of copyright with music is when a composer creates the music, the minute they have created it, they own the copyright, so they own it. So if you want to be able to use it, you need a licence to be able to use it. So it's just understanding that the minute a composer creates something, they own it. And that's why you need a contract. Otherwise, if you don't have something in writing, it's hard to claim that you can use it. So how much does game music cost? These are the types of things that go into working out a fee, because Often it's, it's not that easy, you know, a game developer will say, well, okay, well, what's your rate? It's like, well, it depends, it depends on the game. And these are the types of things that determine cost. So the type of licence that you get, which we'll go into more detail, um, generally non-exclusive, exclusive or full buyout, is the music linear dynamic, we'll go through these in a bit more detail, number of tracks, length of tracks, style of the music, whether you need live musicians, and deadlines. If you need to release your game next week, that's going to cost a hell of a lot more money compared to if it's, you're releasing it next year. So I'm going to talk about licensing. 
And the main four areas to, to worry about licensing really are non-exclusive, exclusive for a period of time, exclusive in perpetuity. Now, funny word, but essentially it means forever. So you want to license something exclusively for the foreseeable future or a full buyout. The best way I find to talk about all these sorts of things is if you can think about buying and renting houses. <laughs> this is how I like to think about licensing options. So when you have a license which is non-exclusive, let's think about it as a composer's built a house and you want to rent that house. But if you don't have a lot of money up front, um, you can rent the house, but you need to rent it with a lot of other people. So um, a non-exclusive licence is essentially you're saying, I want to live in your house, I want to licence the music, but, uh, but anyone else can live in that house as well. So it can be licensed out to lots of other people and you have to share it with them. And the idea is that, you know, money earned over time, at the end of that slide, um, that allows the composer opportunities to earn money for the music. So why is this a good option? If you don't have a lot of money um, to pay an upfront fee, the composer might suggest uh, a non-exclusive. Um, and that way they can earn money from other avenues and it allows them to earn a living. <laughs> um, so it's a good idea if you've got a small budget, um, it kind of works for your game and that allows the composer to potentially earn money elsewhere. Exclusive, if you think about the idea that you want to live in that house, so you want to license the music, but you want to live in that house, but you're the only one that wants to live in that house for a period of time. You don't want to, you don't want to live in the house with anybody else. But it's a period of time, so maybe you license it for five years, you're the only one who wants to live in the house for five years, and after that time, it reverts to non-exclusive and then everyone can live in the house with you. The idea with this one is if you've got a little bit more money, um, you can pay a composer an upfront fee, you can rent it for a period of time, it's exclusive to your game, maybe you like that idea, you know, why is this a good idea? Maybe you want the music to uh, be a part of your branding for your game, you don't want it in any other games, you don't, you don't want it, the music to appear anywhere else. But after maybe five years, um, you know, the, the majority of the game sales have happened and you're not so fussed if it appears anywhere else. And then after that time, the music can be available to other people. Um, but it reduces the amount of music a composer can make, so money earned over time. Um, but they, they earn the upfront commission free fee and then over time, they can release that and earn more money. Exclusive and perpetuity, so in the foreseeable future, so you want to live in the house, you want to rent the house, you want to be the only one that lives in the house forever. You never want to, you never want to live with anyone else, you never want to share the house with anyone else. So you might have a bigger upfront fee to be able to pay the composer to create this. It restricts the composer um, to earn money on that music and so the initial fee will be higher because of this. Um, but why might you might do this compared to a full buyout, for example, and what, what these options are offering you, the non-exclusive and exclusive licences, is that the composer still owns the rights to the music and can earn money from the sale of the OST and other areas. So they can still earn money from sales. And that's really the difference between a full buyout where you're owning everything and you're licensing it from, from them. Um, the composer still can earn money from um, game sales, uh, from the OST sales. So then the other option is, and, and sadly a lot, of, a lot of developers will say, well, I don't want any issues, so how about I just buy out the music? Not realising that that's the most expensive option because what you're saying is I want to buy your house. So buying a house is the most expensive option and it doesn't allow the composer to earn any more money from that because you're often taking those rights for earning any money. So that will be the most expensive option because a composer will say, well, I will set a price based on how much time it takes to create the music plus the perceived value of the music. So um, it's going to be the most expensive option 
What's, what I find is most common um, is probably exclusive for a period of time. A lot of developers want it exclusive for their game for a couple of years and, then, and, and, and don't mind so much if it reverts to non-exclusive afterwards. But that allows the composer to earn money from OST. And that's the difference, whereas you have to think if you want to own the music, you kind of have to pay for that. So other things that, so licensing's a really big deal in a composer working out um, what the cost is, and, and that's a big question that they'll ask you what kind of, and they'll help work out what you need. But other things that go into the cost of music are things like, is the music, does the music need to be linear or dynamic? So if all you need is just one long piece of music that's loopable, um, the, the time taken to do that is quite simple compared to, well, I've got a boss battle scene, I need an intro, and then in that I want lots of layers and it's going to do this and all that, and then halfway through when the boss starts dying and the health comes down, then I want it to the intensity to increase and I want all this kind of stuff, and then when the boss dies I want another thing. You know, ultimately you, you end up, the, compose, the amount of work that the composer has, there's so many layers that they have to um, create. So they're really looking as to, well, you know, in certain areas, does the music need to be linear or does the music need to be dynamic? What's the genre of the music and how complicated is it? So if it's quite simple, um, it wouldn't take as long, but if, you're, if you want epic orchestral with guitars and I want vocalists and I want a choir and I want this, that is gonna take way more work. Um, so the type of, so the genre of the music is gonna affect the cost as well. Um, Another, th another good thing to think about is, well, how much music do you need? Uh, how many, um, how long do the tracks need to be? Um, you know, a title music, for example, only needs to be about a minute or two minutes compared to a boss battle that, you know, it might be five or seven minutes. You know, well, how much music, you're going to need more music in different areas compared to others. And a good question is, well, maybe think about how much music you need in total for your game. So maybe you, you might only need about 20 minutes, maybe, maybe you need about an hour but that helps the composer kind of work out a cost. Do you, know, do you need live musicians? Or can the music be virtual? If you need live musicians, there's obviously cost for that. There's the hiring of the musician. If you're hiring more than one musician, you need a space to record it in. You need recording engineers. So there's, a, there's bigger costs around that um, compared to if you're just creating it yourself as a composer. And so, Typical ways a composer will provide a quote is often what you'll often receive, and, and composers will give you all sorts of different responses, but composers will often say, well, I have a per track fee or a per minute of music fee. Um, hourly rates, you know, maybe they have a day rate or something, but that's less likely. It's usually a per track or per minute. Or they might talk to you about your project and work out a kind of per project fee, so based on how much music you need, how dynamic it is, what it all is, based on all the information they've received. Um, and they, prov might, they might provide you kind of more of a full-scale budget, so everything that you want, all in, bells and whistles, here is what the budget is. And then understanding that maybe your budget doesn't fit that, here's a cut-down version. Typical rates. So another thing which is really interesting is developers say, well, why is there such a wide range of rates that people give? Um, the end of the day, a composer is a business owner and the rates go from free to thousands of dollars per minute. So why is that? Um, and ultimately, you have composers of different calibres and experience. Um, and you've got a lot of, you know, the market's flooded, so you have a lot of people trying to get into the industry. So you're going to have a lot of people lowballing an offer to try and just work on your game. So that's why you have a massive range. But to think about it really is when you're getting lower fees, typically it's a younger composer who doesn't necessarily know, you know, have the, the skills of others. Um, and so that's what you're going to get. Um, so on the left here we have, uh, th th this was taken from Game Sound Con, which is a games conference that happens in San Francisco. So these are in US dollars, uh, just to be mindful. Um, and they do a survey every year asking different questions to the game audio community. Um, so the, the graph on the left is a freelancer composer per minute rate of, from 2021. So the indie is the blue, which is the one up the front. So you can see there's quite a range. It ranges from $100 per minute to about 1,000. 15, there's a bit more than 1,500, but about 1,000. 
Um, typically, a more established composer is going to be on that higher range from that you know, $700 to $1,000. And then you will get a lot of people lowballing to try and get in. Um, on the right, just, just for, for a comparison, there's the 2019, um, the Indies, the Green, so it's the one at the back. And similar sort of spread, um, it's around that 1,000 down to the 100 as well. Um, the freelancer per project fee, so this is per project which may or may not refer to just the music or is a package deal with audio. Um, and also per project, what does that mean? Is that a, a mobile title that is a lot less music or a, a bigger project, so we don't know the size of the project? So in terms of like, like a package deal, on the left here we have the indie, which is green, so it's at the back. Um, and that can really range. The, the highest one there is about the 10,000 down to a few thousand. So it really depends on how much music you need, but they're, but they're kind of typical figures. Um, and again, 2017, for some reason they didn't have the 2021, um, but 2017, um, the indie rate, the indie is the green. And again, it's kind of around that, that same, you know, there's 5,000 there, 10,000 uh, down to 1,000, but you know, it depends on the size of the project. So ultimately what this all kind of leads to is a composer really looking to get a, to work out kind of what a music um, asset list is for you. Um, an example might be that they've worked out the number of tracks that you need, um, the location in the game where it might be, um, general mood and style, and then, you know, I've got here loopable linear, but um, is, it, is the music dynamic? What, what's the needs of the music? Um, another good question is the average amount of time a player is spent in a location is a really good way to sort of work out, well, how long does the track be? Because often you're like, well, I've got no idea. Um, so if a... You know, if, if it's you're in a game and it's the main town, um, and the and the player hangs around the main town and does a lot of things in there, the player may be in in there for like 20 minutes. So you need to think, well, how can what can you do with the music so the music isn't repetitive and annoying? So maybe we need dynamic music there or longer tracks or something. So that's going to help determine uh, the style of uh, the you know whether the music's dynamic, um, how long the track is compared to. Maybe there's just a location, they go and speak to the wizard and it only takes 20 seconds. Well, we probably only need about 20 seconds of music there or, you know, that's, that's another way to help work out the length of music you need. And then down the bottom there, music stingers as well. A lot of people forget that, you know, you need sting-ins and sting-outs. There's little, all the little parts of music um, and they add up as well. So something I wanted to talk about was what if you don't have a lot of money? What are some points of negotiation? So if you don't have a, a good, healthy kind of upfront commission fee that you can give a composer, you can give them a percentage of the game earnings. So when the game is sold, you could give a percentage back to the composer. On successful securement of funding. So let's say you've got a demo, you're putting a demo or a vertical slice together you don't have a lot of money now, but if on successful securing funding from a publisher, you will have money. Maybe you could say to a composer, look, um, how about it's a smaller fee up front, but once I get the, the, the funding, I will pay you back what your total amount is. Uh, and again, this comes down to, well, it depends on the composer you're speaking to. Composers may not be interested in doing this, some may. Um, but if you, if you really want to speak to a composer and they're out of your range, maybe you can talk about different options. Maybe um, look at changing the type of licence because a lot of people will say, well, I want it exclusive forever in my game. I never want it in anywhere else. And I can understand that idea, but it's going to cost you more money. And if you don't have that money, maybe you can't have that. Um, so maybe look at changing the licence and so maybe making it exclusive for a period of time or making it non-exclusive. And um, I, I put here also percentage of OST sales because some developers will say, well, I, I, I want some of that money. And if you're trying to get some of the money but you don't have a, a, you know, much money to give them up front, maybe let them keep all of it. Just some other things to think about. Um, maybe change the scope of the dynamics of the music. Maybe the full, you know, maybe don't you can't afford everything in it. Um, maybe look at making some of the tracks more linear rather than dynamic and loopable. 
uh, uh, or, or making them loopable rather than um, bigger dynamics. Um, another thing that's helped me in the past is maybe looking at some areas that you end up just replacing it with sound effects instead. So it's more ambient rather than having music. So you're reducing the number of tracks. Um, maybe you can't have as many live instrumentalists as you want. Um, and even, you know, a lot of people don't like hearing this, but maybe reducing the scope of the game. If you're struggling with money, um, maybe the game's too big. <laughs> so when I speak to a composer, the sorts of things that I like to talk about, so when you're, to, these, are, these are some points that when you're actually speaking to a composer, just to think about. Um, I like to find out about your game. Um, so if someone says, well, what's, you know, how much do you charge and everything, I want to find out what, you know, because it depends. I want to find out what your game is, what it's about, how much music you need. What I find a lot of developers don't realise is they need more music than they think they do. And it's probably the same with sound effects. They need way more stuff than they think they do. Um, and a lot of people say, well, I only need the track that's only going to be about a minute or two. And then when you speak to them, you're like, well, actually, it needs to be quite longer than that because it's going to get really repetitive. Um, so I really try and find out what your music needs are. And I often find that I start doing a little bit of brainstorming on um, most most developers don't necessarily know even where to put music in their game or how to put it in. So I'll sort of sit down with them and really understand more from a, like a location perspective where music could be and how we could do it to help sort of identify what some options are. Um, and what stage of development are you? Are you, is it a demo? Are you looking to pitch to publishers? Is it a full game? How much music do you need? That will depend. And, and also what, what are your plans with the game? Um, that's going to affect my price as well. Um, if you know, is this a free-to-play game? Um, is this a game where you're looking to get funding? Are you are you releasing it yourself? Is it going to early access? Are you putting it on Kickstarter? Is there money going to be injected in because I feel that it's appropriate that I'm paid for my time? Um, and if you're looking to get money, then I should be paid as well. So when are you when are you going to be getting funding? and that will help determine um, decisions around money. I, will, I do try and work out like a general idea of what people's budgets are um, and what your licensing needs are and sort of suggest what a, what a good licensing option is. I do also just want to note that composers do have indie-friendly rates. Um, they're not obliged to give them to you. <laughs> but if someone really likes your game, and a composer really likes your game and they've got a higher fee, they may offer you an indie rate, which is kind of a reduced rate. Um, so they'll say, look, this is my full rate, but I really like your game and I really want to be a part of it. I can see that you're serious. It's going to be a great game. Um, you know, this is, this is my indie rate. Um, as a composer, I do see myself as a bit of an investor, especially with um, indie games because people don't have a lot of budget. So... I like to ask things about, well, what are your plans and milestones for the game? What are your projected timelines? Um, you know, when are you planning on releasing it? Um, a little bit about what I was talking about before, about how, you know, how are you looking to find funding for the game? What platforms are you releasing it on? Um, because I'm an investor as well. Um, a lot of indie games don't have a lot of budget, so I'm, I'm working hard for my money as well. And so I want to make sure that the game's going to be finished. And I do want to know, um, you know, without sounding harshly, but I want to know that it's, you're going to finish it. And are you a good, uh, are you a developer that really understands the process, the different stages of developing a game? Is it going to happen? Um, so should I invest in this project? Um, and I might ask, what are your marketing plans around this? How are you going to communicate your game? Because, you know, marketing is half of it. Good communication is equally important as good product. And a lot of game developers focus just on developing the game and they don't think about the marketing aspect, their social media and everything else. How are you going to get your game out there? And if you don't do any of that, is it worth my time um, getting involved if you're offering me a lower rate? I do want, this leads to revenue share because a lot of indies will go, well, I'll give you revenue share. So just a couple of points because of a couple of conversations I've had is people said, well, I'll give you revenue share. And I've said, well, what's your offer? And I said, oh, I don't know. So if you are looking at offering somebody revenue share, 
do have a think about what that offer is. Um, and also, when will the composer get paid? Because if you're applying for grants and publishing, is it is part of that money going to pay the composer? If you're, if if, um, or is it just on when you're selling the game? So when do people get paid? What price are you selling the game? Um, because that's going to determine how many units need to be sold before I get my money back. <laughs> um, Another good question is, do you have a contract in place with everyone else you've offered revenue share to? Because often the answer is no, <laughs> uh, which, le which honestly is a red flag because what it leads to is, well, what happens then if you don't have any contracts in place? If you've, if you've got 15 people all working on the project um, or working for revenue share and one of them who's been working for a year leaves the project? Everyone else continues to work on the game and then it gets released and then that dev comes back and said, well, I want some money. You know, are they entitled to have money? People will come and go throughout the project. So what happens there? But if you've given off percentages to everybody else, there's going to be arguments there. So you need things in writing. You need contracts. I understand people don't have a lot of money, but it's things to think about. If you don't have agreements in place and contracts in place, you will have arguments because everybody has different assumptions around things. It's the same as if you've applied for a grant and you've got money from that, you might, you, you will, I'm sure you will have someone on the team expecting that they get paid because it's all revenue share. But your expectation is, no, I'm going to pay a freelancer for that. There's going to be arguments there if, if people don't understand where different revenue share is. Um, Another question. <laughs> a composer is offering to create, my game, uh, create the music for my game for free. Should I say yes? Now, I do believe that you are a business owner and what business decisions you make is up to you, but these are some things to really think about. If the Usually, you will get this offer if a composer has never worked on a game before and is trying to get into the industry and is just trying to get credits. But are they any, you know, do they know, do they understand games? Um, and are they going to do a good job if they get another project that they get money on? Are they going to they going to leave your project and forget about it? Um, do they understand music rights? Unfortunately, a lot of composers don't even understand music rights themselves. So what they'll do is they'll give you all the music, and then they'll run off. Um, but there's no there's no discussion around. Well, their expectation is well, I own the music still, so I can earn money from OST. Whereas the developer's like, well, you gave me the music, so now I earn the money from that. Who can put it on YouTube? Um, what happens if they go and put that music in another game? Are you okay with that? Because I can guarantee <laughs> uh, a lot of composers don't understand music rights. If they're offering for free, um, they're just trying to get their foot in the door and they won't have all of this in order and there will be problems. Um, and the other point is, how will a publisher view this decision? The biggest thing for publishers, they want to see all your contracts, so they're going to ask you about it. If you don't have a contract with your music, that's a red flag for them. Um, and if you're not making good business decisions, that, that may impact you further down the line. My personal opinion is, um, I understand, I get it that a lot of people want to put their efforts together and some people do this, but I think what's appropriate here is to offer someone revenue share. Um, and if it's all for free, it should be a um, non-exclusive so that composer can go off and put that music elsewhere uh, and earn money from it. I think that's the most appropriate for the licensing around this. So just some final words. What I'm, I'm really, my message really is go and speak to composers, come and speak to us. We are more than happy to help work out what you need, even if you don't feel comfortable having these conversations. We are more than happy to sit down with you and help you work out these, um, the, the questions that you have. You know, talk, show us your game, talk to us about your game so that we can help you make these decisions and we can help you work out how much music you need and what the costs are around it. Uh, composers are open to working to limited budgets and then we can work out um, some points of negotiation. Composers are good for helping to promote your game. Um, we have our own social media profiles and we obviously want to talk about all the work that we're doing. But think of a composer as another part of your media. 
team, um, they are going to be talking about it. There's options for interviews on radio and podcasts and um, uh, playing the music on radio. And um, there's, just so, there's a number of different avenues that the music can help promote the game. So that's what a composer will bring. And selling an OST, players love music. I would highly recommend releasing music as an OST. It's just, it's value for the player. Players love a bundle option. They feel like they're getting a good deal. They get the game and the OST. They love that. Um, and also, you don't have to talk music talk with us. Don't feel that you need to understand how to talk about crotchets and all, you know, all sorts of things. Um, instead, talk about the story of your game, the characters within your game. What are the moods? What are, what's the emotion of the game? Um, maybe have you can have some reference tracks, so music that you like, uh, that you can refer to, and images if you've got storyboards or sketches of images, they're really good. And as a composer, we're going we're gonna to understand what your game is, what your story is, and what's going to help with that. So don't feel that you need to be able to speak to us with all the, the um, music lingo. And again, most importantly, don't be afraid to reach out and chat to us. We're more than happy to help. So I just want to recap on some of the questions I went through. So um, what kind of agreement do I make with a composer? Uh, usually a, a contract. Um, how much does music, games music cost? Um, well, that really depends. And I, I really think the best thing is find a composer that you like and approach them and have a chat with them. Uh, and that way they'll be able to provide a quote which is really specific to what you need. Who gets the money from the OST sales? Um, that really needs to be in a contract. I can't stress enough. You need a contract up front and all this stuff needs to be spoken about. Um, it depends on the licence. Um, so what licensing you have will answer this. And again, who can upload the music on Spotify, Bandcamp, Camp and, and monetization platforms? That's going to be dependent on the licence that you have. Um, I don't have a lot of money, but I need a music composer. What can I do? What are my options? Um, we've gone through, we've gone with, I hope you remember a couple, a couple of um, points of negotiation that you can talk to them about. Um, is a composer offering to compose my game for free? Should I say yes? Um, uh, hopefully, you know, um, you've got a couple of points to think about whether that's a good option for you um, and what you can offer them. So, thank you. Questions. <laughs> Thanks, Belinda. Oh, no, they're all lighting up. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, great talk. I love the house analogy, especially. That's cool. um, my question's about the non-exclusive agreements. So, obviously, whoever you sign that with, they understand what that means, or they should. But what, what then, if you work on another game later? Um, do they need to be aware if you're reusing something you've previously done? Because I, I imagine if you do and they don't know that and they figure out later, they might be a bit uh, myth if it's you know, yeah, something I that matches the brief. Yeah. I think it's appropriate and it's polite to let them know. Um, ultimately, it's what the contract says. So legally, you can unless the contract, you know, at, at the end of the day, a contract is just specifying what the agreement is. So you could put particulars and saying, well, I don't want this music putting any other competitive games. So if it's a strategy card game, um, I don't want it to be in any, any other strategy card games. Yeah. Um, if someone wants to get that particular bit, technically you could, but I think it's just polite to, mm. to let them know that it was used in another game and they may feel that it's not appropriate. Do you, have you ever seen a contract where they say it has to be brand new music? I mean, legally, non-exclusive means everyone, you yeah. know, everyone can live in the house. So mm. if you don't want to live in a house with where there's other people, get an exclusive contract yep. or get another piece of non-exclusive music. Mm. Um, I mean, what you could do then is say, look, can you compose other music which is non-exclusive? Yep. That's another option. But then you could go and put it in another game. So ultimately it's, um, um, yeah, it's a tough one. But, yeah. Yep. And, and it comes down to you as a, as a composer, like, well, it's up to you. Like, you know, you can charge them or not. You're a business owner, so, you know, what are, you make up the rules a bit, you know. Yep. 
what do you feel is appropriate for you for getting paid for your time and effort? Mm. Awesome, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> hey. Hi. Um, uh, I've got two kind of silly questions. So I'll just I love silly questions. Throw them <laughs> out there. Um, if you have an exclusive license um, and then they want to do a sequel and you want to revisit and be like, okay, let's, um, uh, you know, maybe they want to use the music again or whatever. Uh, what happens there where, like, <laughs> they have an exclusive license for the previous game, which means that nobody else can have that license, but now you need to license it again, but it's still the same people. How, how does that work? Um, I mean, uh, technically, that music is for that first game they built. If they want to use it in a sequel, they need to relicense it, so is, there is another fee for that. So they need to pay twice for that same music because it, that's what's stated in the contract. Is it like, uh, do you kind of revise that old contract to be like, okay, no longer am I doing an exclusive license for um, just that game, we're gonna add an I mean, I, I think the question would be, why do you want to sell yourself so short? Because you need to make a living and you have had an agreement with them and everybody agreed, everyone signed it. And they said, I understand it's not for sequels. And now they've turned around. They said, uh, uh, and maybe if, you've, if you want to use that same track, they need to understand that there's cost for that. Maybe you could, if you want to be really nice, I suppose you could, you could say that there's no fee. But I think the question would be, you know, um, it, everybody knew that at the start. And, and, you know, you need to be paid for your work. Um, don't feel that just because you've already done the work, you shouldn't get paid for it, you know. There's value in music and if you, you know, um, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, but again, it really comes down to discussions. Everything is negotiable, mm. um, but it really comes down to you and what you want to do. But I would try and say, look, you know, try and try and get, you know, um, you know, a second fee for that. Why not? Because, you know, you work hard for what you do. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Like, it's very, you can sell it separately. Right, yeah. yeah. I guess yeah. that leads into the other question, which was, so I've got a buyout contract, but it was that kind of thing where, like, they were like, here's your contract, and I was like, ah, oh, okay. And now the game's, like, doing really well, and I think it's going to be great, and the soundtrack's probably going to do well as well, and I'm like, they're nice people. Should I, like, approach them and just be like, hey... Do you think, I know I signed this contract, but can I make some money off of the soundtrack or? I think it depends what the, do, so did you did you sign a contract and you didn't get paid? Uh, no. Or just so a low fee? Yeah, it was a low okay. fee. Um, unfortunately, I mean, you could, again, it all comes down to discussions. You could talk to them about that. Ultimately, it comes down to what the contract says. Yeah. Um, what you could put in addition in a contract is, if the game sells over a million copies, I get a percentage of it. Right, so you yeah. can, games can go gangbusters um, and you don't necessarily know if that's going to happen. So maybe you could start putting in things of um, like limits around yeah. things. So after this many game sales, I get this. Maybe it's a revenue share or maybe, maybe it's more money. And after this many sales, this is what happens. It is, you can put that in, um, which helps you you know, everybody has contributed to this. Um, yeah. Cool. Okay, cool. Thank you. That's right. <laughs> hey. <laughs> hey. That was awesome. How are you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hi. Okay, my question is, when you, you said at the very start, uh, and this is about a sync license, so uh, if you've already written a track and it's a non-exclusive track, like maybe it's something that you have, because I know that you have some of those, um, where like someone might approach and be like, hey, we really like this track and we just want to put it in one of our games. Um, if someone comes up to you and is like, hey, in a couple of weeks we want to sync this as, like into a game as, approach, as, as opposed to, you know, in a couple of months, you said that the, the price of that would change? And why is that, even if the, even if the track is already written? Um, I would say that's more for if you're composing music. If you oh, or if you already thinking. have, yeah. So oh, okay, great. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, obviously. I mean, you could do. I mean, you could, but um, uh, I would say if you've already got, if you've, if you've kind of got like a mini catalogue yourself of just mm. music that you give out non-exclusively, um, you know, that's up to you to set the fees, I suppose. But 
Um, I'm thinking more of if you're a composer and you're writing oh, music. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. 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 If oh, the, de- the deadlines affect... The deadlines affect the cost, yeah. Yeah, so the, the commission fee, like the upfront commission fee. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Thanks for making it clear, yeah. <laughs> hey. Hello, thank you. Yeah. Great talk. That's it. Thank you. Um, I have two silly questions. Um, <laughs> the first one is, uh, is there a, um, a typical OST kind of split that is a standard or all thereabouts, even if it's within a, a range? Um, I wouldn't say there's a standard. I think at the end of the day it comes down to what's the perceived value. Um, it, if I was to pick a standard, it might be 70, 30, the 70 yeah. for the composer, 30 for the developer. Um, but really, like, it's a discussion that's had. Um, okay. I think you'd be kind of, you'd be questioning, like, why are they, like, if it was like they wanted a big chunk, you'd be you'd be thinking, well, why, you know? Yeah. Um, and you have to pay for that. You know, you have to pay a higher commission fee for that. Um, I think it's really if, you know, if you're kind of, um, if you're like more triple A or something, you might want more control. Then you, I mean, you probably more typically do a buyout if you're a bigger studio, but um, they can probably afford a higher upfront fee and they're more likely to take a bigger percentage. They might give you a smaller percentage, but... Um, I, I don't. I don't know if there's any standard. It really comes down to perceived value. Yeah. Cool. Makes yeah. sense. Um, the second question is: I just love your thoughts on uh, developers using something like Atlas.io, mm. and um, actually just as an open-ended um, insight into what you think about that. Which one? Oh, uh, like Atlas.io or like libraries of music and sound effects online. In terms of developers using that instead of getting a composer, yeah, yeah um, thoughts as a composer, you know, and that and indie developers going that route. And I mean, I think um, you know, it really comes down to budget. Like, if I would prefer that they license something appropriately, at the end of the day, rather than just going, "Hey, I just want this," and there's no contract around it. It's really clear. Um, but the one point to make is, if you get library off a stock library. You, you can't sell that, you can't sell an LST because you don't have the rights to do that. Mm. Um, so that's the only thing. But it's, it would be more for a game that doesn't need a lot of dynamic music and things. And I think what a lot of, compo- uh, what, what a lot of de- developers realise is, oh, actually, I can't use stock music because it just doesn't fit the style of my mm. game. I need the music to be doing things. I actually need parts yeah. separated. I need stings and I need all sorts of things. So oh, actually, it's probably better if I use a composer. But... Um, yeah. Um, I, I find a lot of developers end up realising they need a composer. Yeah, okay. that's just my thoughts. Thank you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hi. Hi. Um, my question's actually also about sync licensing. Yep. Um, I'm developing a rhythm game, so... Yep. <laughs> um, do you have any tips about working with uh, record labels, uh, existing artists, about li- actually licensing their tracks? I mean, the, the best thing is to talk directly to whoever um, who's managing the artists mm. um, and what that licence is. It'll be the same. There'll be a contract in place. Um, yeah. uh, what, I, what I would find, though, is if uh, uh, managing people that are managing artists, what they'll probably say is if you want it exclusively, you can only, only have it ex- you, uh, uh, would, exclusive for would. the games industry, yeah. but it's available for TV and film. Mm. Um, so they might look at options that way but I would imagine it's um, they would be very thorough in because yep. uh, they're looking you know an artist music there is adverti- you know, advertising has money and you know they're always pitching music so um, mm. but the best thing really is to I can't speak too much about artist music but um, just just contact them and, and yep. you know again don't be afraid to reach out and just ask questions um, okay. Thank talk you. to people yeah Thank you. Yeah, hey. Um, just a quick question about buyout and whatnot. Um, in software, Sorry, de- uh, was... about um, like total purchase of the, the music. So yep. uh, in software development, when I'm selling something to a client, I could just give them the uh, program or I could also give them the source. In the case of this sort of thing, how often is it that you're simply giving the work product or giving all of the source files and all the information that they might need to then uh, produce more music 
in that vein, mm, mm. Uh, which might go to larger conversations. Yeah, I mean, it, you're really talking about who owns the IP of that. Mm. And if you're giving over the project files so yes. that they can create it, uh, I, I mean, you're giving away your IP in a way. So I think you should, if, if you, again, it comes down to you whether, you whether a composer wants to do that, but they should charge for that because... Well, we sure did with yeah. Source, so yeah. yeah. Um, it was more like how common is this in the industry or whether it's not um, very common. I, I wouldn't say it's that common, but I mm. have had that discussion recently. Um, and a lot of it is just... I mean, there's so much to it because it comes down to, well, it, it, like, it's not that straightforward because composers have virtual instruments and plugins and all this stuff. So we spend thousands of dollars on uh, being able to make sounds virtually. And so if someone wants to take that project file and use it, they need access to all the plugins as well. So they need licenses to it. You can't have my license because it's licensed to me. So then you would have to buy a license for all those plugins. You're essentially buying thousands of dollars worth of virtual instruments. My question would be, and, there was, and I was recently speaking to a studio about this, and the result was it's too expensive and do you really need it? Um, at the end of the day, if you can provide them the the you know the the layers that they need and everything, and if you you know, um, but it, it, if they wanted the project file, it, there's a fee on for that. Um, okay. It's just it's just more expensive ultimately. Cool. Yeah. Good to know. Yeah. Very very similar with the software. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Same yeah. answers. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Hello. Hey. Thanks for the talk, Belinda. Hey, that's Fantastic. Right. Um, uh, just a question uh, from a game developer and composer point of view. Yep. Um, where would a game developer go to to get these kind of contracts to give to their composer they're hiring uh, and vice versa for a composer to a game developer? Um, some composers have templates themselves um, or you would go and speak to a lawyer who understands the game development and music composition industry um, I can't think of his name off the top of my head now, but I can give you a record if you need a recommendation. Arts, 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 law. You can go to arts law. arts law is one. Um, I can't remember his name. Um, there's a guy that un really understands. Um, I'll, I'll give you his name if you want. Yeah, yeah I, can't, no I just worries. can't remember his name. <laughs> no worries. It was more a general for everyone kind of question. Yeah. Yeah. No yeah. Worries. Okay. Thank you. Though, yeah. But I'll but it, it, I suppose it's both sides, you know, if a composer feels that they kind of want control over what's in the contract, they can do it themselves. Otherwise, as a game studio, you'd go to a lawyer and get that contract written up. And again, it's, there's some there's general templates that they have, and then it's more if there's any specifics within that um, that you would discuss. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Hey. Um, I might have misunderstood uh, when you were going through the types of licenses, but what is the difference between an exclusive license in perpetuity versus a buyout? Is the buyout kind of taking your rights to attribution or something as well? Yeah, so uh, exclusive is you, you still keep rights to it. So you still own the house, um, which means I can still earn money from the OST. Um, and any like if, if the music gets played on radio, mm -hmm. there's money there. It mightn't be a lot of money, but who gets that money? So I keep the I keep the potential to earn money, even if it's exclusive forever in the game. Because ultimately what you're really trying to do is who gets the money from the OST? Yeah. And you have to understand that there's money there. There's there could be a few thousand dollars. Um, and you I, I think you should be you should be the one getting that if you've if you've um, if you're doing um, you know, the, you want to build a career as a composer. Um, so that's essentially what it is, where a full buyout is you... And also, what about perform, performances of the music? You would then have to go and get permission. If, 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 there's a, if they have bought the music, you would have to go and get permission for all of that sort of stuff. So, it, um, right. so it's, it's usually larger, like AAA and things, that yeah. want control over everything, and they're going to promote the music and they can afford it, they'll do that. Yeah. But um, it really comes down to keeping your rights so that you can earn money from sale of the OST. Right, yep. yeah. So exclusivity is more in relation to, like, it being used in another game context rather than, like... Yeah, yeah, and then exclusive to, to that game. Yeah. I just want it in that game. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Thank you. That's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hey. Hey, that was awesome. Yeah. So good. Um, I wish I had that <laughs> you know, years ago, but it's really cool. Um, I suppose, like, I just felt like from that question, my clarification was 
So with a buyout, you're probably discrediting the industry to a degree in that you're, there's a whole bunch of stuff there that's like a whole bunch of royalties that aren't claimed because a lot of devs wouldn't know how to actually do the back end mm. or put your music in the right places or put your, it on. Mm. Like it just seems like mm. it kind yeah. of, to me, it was a, a, an eye-opening thing when you broke it down where it's just like, oh, there's, I've heard so much buyout chat. Yeah. And it really makes me sad. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you raise like, a really interesting yeah. point because a lot of developers go, well, I'll do a full buyout, not realising that that means that they are then responsible in a way to put it on Spotify, to put it on YouTube. because like they a label. Get, yeah. Yeah, which is and insane. Which is... That's wild. Because, mm. like, they're probably inexperienced in that. Mm. Yeah. They won't do it, yeah. 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 And a, a lot of uh, kind of smaller developers don't realise all of that. Whereas bigger studios do, they've got departments to promote and, and, and do it all. Um, and the question is, well, as a smaller dev, why do you need all of that? A composer's going to, you know, help promote like and put it out. it's for convenience or mm. just not an understanding? Convenience they, yeah. and not understanding. They don't yeah. realise they, at the end of the day, they want it in their game. They want to use it in their game. They want to put it. They want to be able to use it for promotion. They want it on trailers and stuff. They just don't want any issues. Yeah. Um, they don't realise they can have that with a license, rather mm. than you don't need a full buyout. And no, they don't. I, I and love they, that. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. Because like, no, right. I think that's just that's like, so question. important. Yeah. It w I don't even know if it's a question. It's just like a statement of just like clarity, being like, <laughs> oh my god, what are we doing? Yeah. So great. Thank no, you. no, it's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> hey. Heaps of great information. Hey. Thanks, Brenda. Yeah, this is kind of related to that. In um. And I noticed that APRA was saying they're going to start to work on cue sheets in the game industry, which is really oh, great. Okay. Yeah. But some of the film and TV stuff I've done, the standard thing is work for hire. Mm. It's done under work for hire where they retain the copyright. And if you're lucky and you put that clause in that says the writer's share is returned for public performance purposes, so if it does get hit, you, know, you mm. get the writer's share. Should that not be in a, a license on a game, game contract or game deal memo, if you would? You know what I'm saying? You just want to avoid that... Say so we're the we're going to I'm going to retain the rights. You basically in a game that we're talking about retaining the rights exclusives if you retain the copyright and you're licensing it back to the game developer um, in, in limited you know for five years or or more. I mean I suppose ultimately it's a lawyerly question, but you yeah, come any, across it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean I've, the the games industry is still probably a little bit behind compared to TV and yeah. film, but ultimately. It's whatever you agree upon in the yeah. contract. Yeah, but so I'm, based yeah. on today, which was fantastic information, mm -hmm. including for me, and I've mm -hmm. been around the block, but I'm inclined to want to strike that work for our clause from future contracts, mm -hmm. at least in the game industry. I haven't seen it. Yeah. It's usually quite straightforward, but it's okay. not to say that it, it, it couldn't. I mean, I, uh, you know, you, um, I have heard of composers where they've had to you know, sort of give away their rights and then license them back and things. So it's ultimately what's kind of what's agreed upon and, and how you negotiate. Yeah, and um, you don't have to, if someone hands you a contract, mm. you don't have to, mm. yeah. like you say, have a discussion. You don't have to say, okay, I'll sign yeah. it because yeah. I want to work. You can say, well, yeah. it's up for a discussion. Thanks. But it, it, it can get yeah. quite, you know, oh, yeah. uh, complicated. Yeah. And and um, I think, it re again, it comes down to, well, what's the value of the music and does... Does the game developers, do they really want that, you know, the money from the OST and um, From and what things? I got today, basically, if you, were, if you were licensing it back to them, you're retaining the copyright, mm. right? Mm. And the writer's share, mm. like if it's mm. a song for, you know. Yeah. Okay. And I'm sure, you know, bigger studios, there are situations like that. Um, I personally haven't come across it. Okay, but, cool. Um, mm. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um. No, my question's awesome. Thanks so much for all your questions. Um, and I just want to say, if you're developing a game or need help with putting a budget together for grants or that sort of same thing, always feel you know feel free to come up and ask me questions or email me. I'm more than happy to help you answer answer your audio questions. Thank you. All right. <laughs>